Hello, my name is Chris Barkin. I want to welcome all of you to the first William W. Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar of the spring 2013 semester. I appreciate all of you joining us. Before we start, I uh, have a couple of housekeeping items, the usual ones we want to take care of. First of all, if you have a cell phone, please uh, turn it off or put it on vibrate or mute or whatever so that we don't disturb the speaker. I'm going to check mine right now. I'm good. Um, if we have a fire alarm, exit from these doors and turn and take the nearest safe stairway down to the uh, ground level and then exit. Uh, I would like to recommend that we exit to the north side of the building, assuming that doors are open, uh, and um, gather on the north side of Main Street um, by, um, by the Hydro Lab. <coughs> and let's use the buddy system, make note of who's next to you and make sure that your uh, uh, partner is out. Um, we're going to be passing around an attendance sheet. If you didn't already sign it, please add your name. It was outside by the pizza before, so please uh, add your name if you're not. It's important for us in terms of getting reimbursed for this. Um, also, if you did not receive a direct email announcement for this seminar, but you would like to, put your email name, email address on there, and we'll add you to the list. Um, do we have our list of organizations? Yes. <clears throat> OK. Um, we're very pleased to have a pretty large group of uh, people and organizations joining us from around the country. Um, we have University of Illinois Chicago, Hanson Professional Services, Norfolk Southern, Parsons Brinkerhoff, CSX, uh, Illinois Department of Transportation, um, Radstar Engineering, Parsons, New York State DOT, uh, Transport Environmental Engineering, CTA, LTK Engineering, um, the U.S. EPA, Norm West, I think you know Norm, um, Wisconsin DOT, uh, Trinity Industries, Kansas City Southern, and uh, URS Corporation. We welcome all of you for uh, your and, and, and appreciate having your participation in the, the Hay mm -hmm. Seminar. Um, I'll just ask this, the speaker if there are any questions that come up, if you could repeat them. Sure. Sometimes the mm -hmm. microphone won't pick up somebody from the back. And we'll of the do room. questions, uh, Chris, at the back end? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. Are you announcing that? Yeah. Okay. So let me introduce briefly introduce uh, Brennan Corrin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brennan Corrin. I'm here on behalf of the Arima Student Chapter here at UIUC, and uh, here to announce that this afternoon. Starting at 5.30, we will be holding a happy hour at the uh, Blind Pig on Walnut Street uh, in honor of our uh, speaker today. So, who won't be? Who will not be there? Will not be yeah. there. We'll still have a, have a drink and a good time in his honor. So That's right. And, and we will be joined by Professor Stefan Usland okay. from KTH University. Well, with whom you can bring my photo to the right, happy hour. Right, right. <laughs> and we'll also have the leftover pizza, so uh, okay. please join us. It's uh, always a lot of fun. Well, let me introduce our speaker today. Uh, North American railroads are highly energy efficient. You've heard me say it in our classes. You've seen it on the TV commercials. Um, um, but nevertheless, they still consume very large quantities of fuel because of the enormous amount of transportation that they provide. And in fact, fuel is the railroad industry's second largest operating expense, exceeded only by labor expense. Um, now, the continued high cost of oil, coupled with uh, increasingly uh, stringent emission standards and a desire for energy independence and security, has given freight railroads a renewed focus on various alternative energy sources. Uh, Biodiesel, liquefied natural gas, dual mode battery, and electric locomotive technologies have all been developed and tested and implemented to varying degrees. However, a variety of technical, operational, and institutional challenges will have to be addressed if these technologies are to supplement or supplant diesel electric propulsion on a national scale uh, to any significant degree. And there is no one better qualified to discuss these challenges than our speaker today. Michael Iden is the General Director of Car and Locomotive Engineering at the Union Pacific Railroad. His responsibilities and involvement include new locomotive technologies, emissions, and alternative fuels. He began his railroad career with the Southern Railway, then moved over to a, a stint at EMD, one of the principal U.S. locomotive manufacturers. Then he joined the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad, and uh, when the CNNW merged with Union Pacific, he moved with them. In fact, some say that was the principal reason for the acquisition. No, no. no. <laughs> um, 
he, um, he has substantial experience and expertise in locomotive manufacturing operations and maintenance. Uh, he completed his BS degree in mechanical engineering at the Milwaukee School of Engineering and a Master of Management degree at Northwestern University, which he attended under a General Motors Fellowship. Mike is a re registered professional engineer in several states and holds a federal locomotive engineer's license. Beyond his contributions for his employers, he's long been an outspoken leader for the rail industry in a variety of mechanical engineering topics. He's a member and former chairman of several AAR committees, including the AAR Locomotive Committee and the AAR Technology Sc Scanning Committee, the latter of which oversees our research work at the, here at the University of Illinois. He's the recipient of five patents and has several others pending. And in recognition of his career-long uh, and pioneering efforts developing more energy efficient and environmentally friendly locomotive technologies, he was the recipient of the AAR's uh, 2012 John H. Chafee Environmental Excellence Award. So please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Mr. Michael Iden, who will present the William W. Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar today on Freight Railroad Energy Alternatives and Challenges. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, appreciate your time. And uh, what we're going to be talking about, uh, obviously, as you can see, is freight railroad energy from our perspective at Union Pacific. What are the alternatives and the challenges? And a, a quick agenda here so you get the picture, uh, a, a lot of information. You will have the presentation available uh, after the presentation. But uh, basically, I'm, I'm, I'm starting, I'm breaking this down into three things. The first is a very quick look at energy and work. Uh, what is the total energy consumed in the U.S. and where do the railroads fit in that picture? And then what I think is a very important uh, aspect of, of technology, which is managing technology, and in my opinion, some material which should, I feel, be in engineering curriculum and even in business school curriculum for anybody who will not necessarily be a technologist but will manage technology. And then we're going to break into the main portion, which is uh, alternative fuels and energy. And uh, to start with, uh, a little bit about energy and work. Uh, in, in light of the fact that yesterday was uh, Valentine's Day, uh, you know, the saying, love makes the world go round. <laughs> but it's energy that does the work. Uh, energy is the capacity for doing work, and work, of course, in the classic engineering definition, is the application of force to a body over a distance. In other words, for example, in our world, moving freight trains and freight from point A to point B. Where does railroad energy come from? Well, typically, most of our energy comes from fuels, and uh, in our case, with uh, diesel fuel or when you have electrified railroads, it's uh, electricity which is generated typically uh, from uh, fuels or some other energy source. And we are also involved in the management of potential energy, which is the energy of elevation, and kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. And we expend energy both to accelerate and move trains as well as, in effect, uh, drawing dynamic braking energy and harnessing uh, uh, kinetic energy converting it to dynamic braking energy and air brake capacity to stop trains and slow them down. So we're going to talk about what changes will we likely see in terms of uh, freight railroad energy and uh, why or why not. Uh, th this chart is from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. They actually have a chart for 2009. I chose the 2008 chart because this was the peak of recorded energy use in the United States for the year 2008 obviously the year before the, the economy uh, went into a, a temporary uh, decline. And you can see here uh, the estimated energy use in the year 2008 was a total of 99 quadrillion BTUs or British thermal units. And th basically what, what you need to look at on the chart is the thickness of the lines going across which is scaled these boxes at the beginning and at the end are not the scale. So it's a little misleading. Uh, I wish they had really put these boxes. So again, in the case of, uh, at the bottom here, uh, petroleum, you can see that uh, 37.13 quads of, of petroleum energy were used, and it breaks off into the different uh, usages, and they broke it down between electrical generation, residential use, which is primarily heating, Commercial use, which is probably heating also. Industrial processes for furnaces and so on in, in um, uh, production motors. And then the bottom category is transportation. And transportation is, is it's everything that's transportation lumped together. 
And what I've done is I've added a rough calculation of efficiency, which if you look at what's coming out of each of these five boxes, in the case of transportation, for example, according to Lawrence Livermore, 6.96 quads of energy produced useful transportation work, and 20.9 quads went out as waste heat. Uh, so you end up with a 25% efficiency for transportation. When, when we look at the transport sector, um, again, this is the lowest efficiency of those five categories, roughly 25%. 75% of the energy used for transportation went to waste. It was rejected heat. Uh, when you look at it, let's look at the realities. Uh, when you start out, for example, the, the largest use for of petroleum in the United States is for gasoline-powered automobiles. Typical gasoline engine, uh, the typical gasoline uh, powered automobile puts 14 to 26 percent of its energy down to the pavement. So when you go to a gas station and you buy 20 gallons of gas, you're effectively going to end up using five gallons to go where you need to go and 15 gallons are going to be lost to thermal inefficiencies. In the railroad industry, with our diesel locomotives, the large bore diesel engines we have are typically up around 40% thermal efficiency. When you combine the efficiencies of the electrical transmission down to the rails, we end up with about 33%. So in, in my opinion, of all the transport categories, uh, the, 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 the locomotives are probably the best performer in this area. And again, what we're really limited by here are the, uh, the laws of thermodynamics and, and the inefficiencies, which are uh, very difficult to, uh, to reduce beyond what they already are. Now, we're going to talk about technological change. Uh, the classic model of changing technology is in this green box. Uh, Tyler comes up with an idea, okay, and uh, we call that an invention. And somebody then takes the idea and turns it into an innovation, which is a practical application of the idea. And then the innovation, which has now been commercialized or turned into a product, is, is uh, we go through diffusion and commercialization and put it in, into use. That's the classic model of technological change. In reality, what we have is this process in the green box, but we also have a whole bunch of uh, what I call stick and slip operations here. Uh, we go through learning curves. We have human behavior. Not everybody wants to do, not everybody wants to use the new product, or they may want to use the new product the way Tyler, the inventor, didn't foresee it being used. So there, there's all sorts of things that make the process nonlinear, and even technological intervention. Uh, I've seen this in my industry, in the railroad industry, where we come up with, for example, the classic case I had many years ago was, uh, a, a better technology for gauging fuel quantity in the fuel tank. We start to invest, we start putting it on the locomotives, and we have a sawtooth of progress where we're installing it on locomotives. Before we get complete, guess what? Tyler comes up with a better fuel gauge and we start putting that on. So, so we have this incomplete sawtooth where we're putting technology on, something better comes along. Uh, who just got a new generation smartphone in here? Anybody? Last year, anybody get a new generation phone? Do you know anybody who gets a new generation phone quite frequently? Well, there you go. That's tech. That's that. That's what I'm talking about. You know, the better. Again, for example, the better mousetrap inventiveness. So again, the the, the the linear process of technological change doesn't happen in that manner. It's it's very rough at times. There's a gentleman named Lowell Steele who was the chief technology planner at General Electric back in the 80s. And in uh, 1989, he published a book called Managing Technology. And I actually read a summary of this book on a flight from Salt Lake City to Chicago. And when I read it, I felt like getting up and running down the aisle screaming, Eureka! Because I read a, a summary article, and at that time, he had published an article in the Harvard Business Review on the seven misconceptions about technology, and he subsequently expanded it to nine, and he published that book. But in essence, uh, can you can you see this here, or is it a little hard to see? Okay, to run through them real quick, what he says is the realities are: use only what's good enough, 
past practice limits future changes. You always got to watch out for Murphy's Law. Things will go wrong. Future unknowns are risky. The customer determines value, not the creator of the product. New is not necessarily better. Infrastructure, and particularly in this industry, infrastructure is often the weakest link. You have to have standards, constraints, and routine, and you have to you have to factor that in. And last, new technology requires a new support system. Uh, the, the best example of that is go back to the classic 1945-1950 era when the U.S. railroads were converting from steam locomotives powered primarily with coal to diesel-electric locomotives with a new fuel, a liquid. The entire infrastructure for steam locomotives essentially was thrown away. Shops, water towers, coaling towers, ash pits, ash removal machinery, uh, you know, the, the, the processes for replacing boiler flue tubes, all went out the window in about a 10-year period as the industry transitioned over to diesel-electric locomotives. And these changes don't happen very often, and they can be very tumultuous when they occur. A little bit on, you know, technology. Railroads have been implementing technology since the Civil War. Uh, the, the Master Car Builders Association was formed in 1867 to start to bring harmony and standardization to freight car design in the post-Civil War United States. The uh, Association of American Railroads, the industry trade group, was formed in 1934 to start creating standards for uh, equipment taking over that role from the master car builders, standards for equipment and operating standards. And, and I've listed some technologies here. Uh, the automatic air brake, which was designed by George Westinghouse, patented in 1872. It was finally mandated by a federal regulation in 1893, and there was this 20-year period where there was a lot of debate and consternation over whose version of air brake to use and standardize. There were incompatible air brake systems. They all functioned more or less the same, but if Railroad A equipped its cars with Westinghouse's air brake system and Railroad B equipped its cars with somebody else's air brake system, the two air brake systems weren't necessarily compatible. You could not run those trains, you could not run those cars in the same train and get the air brakes to function. So in an industry like ours, standardization is very, very critical. There are a lot of factors affecting technological change. And by the way, I've got these uh, purple lightning uh, uh, symbols out here. And those are just kind of reminders to you about the nine technological realities here that, that uh, Lowell Steele postulated back in 1989, particularly things like you know standards are necessary, infrastructure can be a weak link, and so on. So when you see those, I'm kind of reminding you to go back to Steele's uh, technological realities. Uh, before we jump into talking about fuels and so on, one last thing here about the, the U.S. freight railroads. This is a chart from the Association of American Railroads, and you can see a major event happened here on October 14, 1980. That was the date that the U.S. Congress, uh, or th that was the date that uh, Congress had passed the Staggers Act, which deregulated the U.S. railroad industry. And on that date, President Jimmy Carter signed the Staggers Act uh, into effect, and it became law. That was the point at which the U.S. railroad industry was deregulated. And you can see what happened. Uh, productivity went up, volume went up, Revenues and rates tended to go down. The railroad industry started handling much more freight, and it actually has grown tremendously since it was deregulated. Uh, there was an article in The Economist magazine, July 22nd, 2010. Great article. If, if, if you can find it, I suggest you go back. Bottom line, what The Economist said is, America's system of rail freight is the world's best. And there are a number of reasons for that, and we're actually going to touch on some of them. Now, let's take a look at North American rail. And by North America, I'm, I'm focusing on North America for one reason. This map in the middle with the yellow lines, those are all of the standard gauge railroads, common carrier railroads in Canada, the US, and Mexico. And in effect, we have one continental railroad system. You can virtually haul any freight car with the exception, for example, of the high clearance double stack cars that require special route and track designation. But you can handle uh, typical, typically any freight car from far northern Canada all the way down to the Yucatan Peninsula or from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. 
and, and, and it's important that we think about um, the, the Continental Rail Network and not necessarily the corporate systems, which are kind of analogous to, uh, for example, in Europe, the national systems where you have a German rail uh, infrastructure and Italian infrastructure and so on. Those railroads are connected, but there's very little interoperability, and we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about the impact of the loss of interoperability on North American freight operations. Okay, uh, this is just an example. Uh, I've got three trains plotted here. You can see the, the red line of every week, Union Pacific operates a train of uh, uh, vegetables, and primarily vegetables, a perishable train from Stockton, California. We operate it to Chicago, and we hand the train to CSX Transportation with our locomotives. They take the entire train and run to Albany, New York, unload the train, run the empty train back to us in Chicago. We take the empty train back to Stockton, or up to the state of Washington and reload it. The train goes through Chicago with our locomotive. This is called a run-through train. So we have two railroads interchanging not only freight cars, but the whole train with the locomotives, and it's a, an interoperable network. A couple other examples. Uh, we have a, uh, an intermodal train. handles a lot of UPS high-priority packages between Los Angeles and Atlanta. Uh, the train is interchanged between Union Pacific and Norfolk Southern in, I believe, Memphis. Another train runs uh, from an auto plant in Oshawa, Ontario. Canadian National brings it into Chicago, and C uh, Union Pacific takes the train to, uh, to Denver. It's particularly where we pass through these urban areas where there has been a lot of improvement, uh, whereas decades ago, railroads used to have day -long, a day-long delay at minimum, passing freight cars from one railroad to another in a large urban area like Chicago. Now we see many of these trains ver literally passing through urban areas like Chicago in, in a fraction of a day. I'm not going to talk a lot about, this is the only slide to talk about diesel locomotives, just to give you a little basic so everybody understands. When I talk about diesel locomotives, I'm actually talking about a diesel electric locomotive. This is a locomotive at one of the manufacturers, you can see it's not complete. The trucks or bogey assemblies are not underneath it. Uh, the car body is missing. You can see the diesel engine. But essentially, a diesel electric locomotive is a diesel engine with an alternator, produces AC power. Uh, in the case of this, the AC is rectified to DC. The DC goes into inverters, which then go down to the AC motors. There are some DC locomotives still being made and so on. So instead of AC motors, you have DC but the, the basic hardware, for the most part, other than the motors, is the same. At the top, just to show you some historical links here, back in 1893, a man named J.J. Heilman, he lived in France, I believe he was a Swiss, he was born in Switzerland, he built a locomotive called the Fusée Electrique, the electric rocket. This was built in France, it actually ran for a part of one year. He had a steam boiler with a reciprocating engine, driving a generator which produced DC power which went down to eight DC traction motors in two four axle trucks or bogies. That was 120 years ago. The big difference, obviously, much simpler technology and very crude, but the one big difference was the, the prime mover on board. Instead of a boiler and a reciprocating steam engine, in the case of Mr. Heilman's uh, locomotive, today, 120 years later, we have a, uh, uh, a diesel engine providing the uh, uh, primary power for the generation. Now, now we're going to get into fuels. Uh, this is a chart which came from uh, Dr. James Everhart, who uh, was with the U.S. Department of Energy. This is from a presentation he made in 2001. And uh, what we're plotting here on a scale from 0 to 100 percent is energy, energy density per gallon or per, per, per volume. And you can see we're basing diesel fuel as 100%. Uh, FT is fischer tropsch synthetic diesel. Uh, energy density there is about 94%. And uh, coming down the scale, uh, biodiesel, uh, B100, about 90%. So you lose going from petroleum diesel to biodiesel, uh, you lose about 10% of the energy content. So to get the same amount of work, you actually will need roughly 10% more of the fuel to do the same amount of work. The reason why 
diesel has been the preferred fuel for heavy freight transport, not only for trucks and for railroads. And waterway towboats, for example, is because of energy density, the ability to get the maximum amount of energy content, which is the performance ability for work, into the available capacity on board the vehicle. So energy content is a very important factor. Talking now about diesel versus biodiesel. Again, uh, pure biodiesel, about 10% less energy density than petroleum diesel. Uh, biodiesel has, does not reduce all emissions. The, the one emission which there is still uh, a lot of work to be done is on oxides of nitrogen or NOx. Uh, biodiesel tends to increase NOx uh, production. Uh, it will reduce greenhouse gas and some reduction on particulate matter, but NOx, which is one of the criteria emittance, will go up with biodiesel as compared to regular diesel. There are fuel storage and use issues. Uh, for example, what we call cloud point. Cloud point is the temperature of a fuel at which the paraffin uh, wax molecules start to agglomerate. And when you have a very high cloud point for any type of a diesel type fuel, in wintertime conditions, you run the possibility of the risk that your fuel filters may plug and you may not get enough fuel to the injectors to keep the engine performing. So there are some issues here. Uh, biodiesel also tends to be hydroscopic. In storage tanks, it tends to absorb water. Uh, there are new injection technologies such as common rail fuel injection, which are coming into locomotive engines. They're already in automotive gasoline engines. Um, most, I believe, of the current uh, new truck engines on the highway use common rail. Common rail fuel injection is very high pressure injection, and it also requires very, very clean fuel in terms of particles inside the fuel. <coughs> There are some issues that have been identified already with biodiesel and even some petroleum fuels with particles and even salts in the fuels which can play it out in common rail injectors and cause an engine to lose power. Uh, moving down, um, we, we have the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, Tier 4 Locomotive Emission Standard for new locomotives delivered in 2015 and beyond. Tier 4 will require after treatment exhaust after treatment to get down to not exceeding the levels of the criteria uh, emittance which have been established by that regulation. The introduction of tier four locomotive technology, which is primarily centered around the diesel engine, will be the biggest technological change in my opinion since the railroads dieselized after World War II. We have not had any significant amount. We've, at Union Pacific, we've had some experimental locomotives with various after-treatment devices, but after-treatment has not been used on locomotives <coughs> in the United States and very limited application even in Europe. The last thing to keep in mind is locomotive engine technology is vastly different from truck engine technology. Uh, in 2008, I believe a total of 1,400 locomotives were sold domestically for the North American railroads, and in a good year, the class eight diesel truck market exceeds more than 100,000 engines. So we're talking about a huge difference in scale here between the handful, less than a handful of companies that are making large bore diesel engines for locomotives and a multitude of companies that are making high speed small bore engines for the diesel truck market. Other liquid fuels, uh, we've mentioned Fisher Trosh, FT or Synfuel, and d and &E, which is dimethyl ether. Uh, the ideal goal for any alternative fuel vis-a-vis -vis diesel would be to minimize your loss of energy density or energy content because you're going to need more fuel to do the same amount of work. Again, you can refer back to Dr. Everhart's chart. FT or synthetic diesel uh, is, is traditionally it's been historically uh, a coal to uh, liquid or a gas to liquid fuel uh, using a fischer tropsch process. There are no infrastructure changes required in terms of how you fuel locomotives or trucks or cars using FT fuel versus petroleum fuel, uh, but it does have 7% less energy density, and you will have lower vehicle emissions. Uh, some of the emissions will be lower, but you tend to have point source emissions increases in, in, in terms of the plant that produces the Fischer-Tropsch fuel because it's a catalytic process 
uh, involving heat, pressure, catalysts, and so on. So there's a number of things that need to be balanced out there. Uh, th there's been some talk in the railroad industry uh, and outside the industry about using DME, dimethyl ether, which is uh, technically methoxymethane. Uh, DME is a diesel-like fuel. In fact, there are, I believe, trucks and possibly even buses in Sweden which are running on DME instead of diesel. Uh, one of the issues with DME is DME evaporates at minus 11 degrees Fahrenheit. So even on a day like today, if I had a vented fuel tank, which is common on uh, trucks and uh, locomotives because diesel fuel has such a high uh, uh, evaporation temperature, you don't need to have a sealed tank. With DME, you now have to have a sealed pressure resistant tank because otherwise, unless your temperature is below minus 11 Fahrenheit, your fuel is going to evaporate. So that's, that's a, a major drawback to DME. And uh, last at the bottom I have, what about liquefied natural gas or LNG? Uh, LNG is, uh, it is not a direct substitute for diesel fuel. And again, I'm going to draw back to one of Steele's realities here, talking about infrastructure. So it's not a direct replacement for diesel fuel. That means I'm going to have to have an infrastructure for LNG as well. Uh, it is cryogenic. Uh, liquefied natural gas is a liquid, it has a temperature of uh, minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit. The energy density is 40% uh, less than diesel fuel, so you need roughly one and three quarter gallons of LNG to do the same work as one gallon of diesel fuel. Onboard storage on a locomotive is impractical. Now there are highway trucks, class eight, nominally diesel trucks, which have been converted to run on LNG, and you may be able to see them. They have very large fuel tanks. Instead of the two saddle tanks, they will have much longer fuel tanks, again, uh, to get you know, the, the, the same range as if they were operating on diesel fuel. With locomotives with the under-platform fuel tank between the trucks or bogies, you have to store LNG in insulated cylindrical storage tanks you simply cannot get enough of these cylindrical tanks underneath the locomotive where the classic diesel fuel tank is. If we converted a road locomotive to LNG with truck style cylinders underneath the locomotive, instead of a locomotive with an operating range of about a thousand miles, we would probably be down to about 250 miles. We wouldn't even be able to operate from Chicago to Omaha, which is just under 500 miles, without refueling the locomotive twice. Right now we operate at least a thousand, and in some cases more than a thousand miles before we refuel the locomotive with diesel fuel. The LNG introduces a real problem with energy capacity and how it's used. If the railroad industry is to convert to LNG to some extent, uh, substituting LNG for diesel fuel, it will be a complex technological change and it will involve what, what we refer to as the five LNG challenges. Uh, first of all, I made a check mark here for increase in availability. It's not a challenge because there is gas out there. In fact, if you probably see it or hear it every day in the media about the surplus of natural gas in the United States due to the recent technology changes with fracking, uh, horizontal drilling and so on, there is a glut of natural gas in the United States, but it's a gas. So I'm giving a check mark to that because it's there. The, the four question mark lines, uh, you have to have a liquefaction plant, or you have to have liquefaction plants. You have to take the gas, and you have to compress it and chill it to form the liquid. Uh, there are very few liquefaction plants. You have to have locomotives and the engines on board that can use the fuel. And to use natural gas, it has to be a dual fuel locomotive, dual fuel engine. You use a small amount of diesel fuel as the pilot igniter for the natural gas. In effect, what you are doing is you are taking a diesel engine, which operates on a diesel cycle, a compression cycle, and you are in effect converting it to an auto cycle where you're using a small amount of diesel fuel in lieu of a spark plug. So in effect, you're converting a, a dual fuel diesel locomotive is a, is a conversion to an auto cycle engine in effect. And uh, you have to have LNG tenders and a refueling infrastructure, and you have to make changes to your training locomotive operations to handle these tenders. It's kind of like um, if you've ever rented, let's say, a, a, a trailer to, to move to campus or back home, 
and you, you drag this trailer behind you, well, you know, imagine driving around all the time with that trailer behind your car. That's what a fuel tender is. You have a tender, a car, which is coupled to the locomotive, providing natural gas to the dual fuel locomotive. And uh, again, at the bottom, are the economics favorable? Those are just, that's a decision for individual railroads to make uh, on, on their own basis. We're not going to talk about economics. I do not touch that. And uh, if, if the economics are favorable for a railroad or, or railroads, uh, LNG may substitute for diesel fuel, but I don't think we will ever see 100% substitution. There's been a lot of work on dual fuel locomotives involving natural gas. This is not a new effort. In reality, there have been eight attempts to look at gaseous fuels instead of diesel fuel since the 1930s. And in fact, the two photos up here, the left photo, the BN, which is Burlington Northern, which is now part of BNSF, that's our main competitor in the western U.S. Uh, the Burlington Northern had two locomotives which ran on a dual fuel mix back in the late 1980s up till 1995. And uh, in the 1990s, Union Pacific funded a research program at General Electric in Pennsylvania, an electromotive uh, division, which was the electromotive division of EMD, or General Motors at the time, uh, in LaGrange, Illinois. And you can see there was a... Uh, the BN consist, the BN had two 20,000 gallon fuel tenders hauling LNG, and our program, Union Pacific, purchased two 30,000 gallon cryogenic tenders to support the, uh, the two projects at EMD and GE. Uh, the BN locomotives were 3,000 horsepower. It was a, what's called a low pressure technology. The two EMD and two GE locomotives, the goal was to have high pressure injection for roughly 4,000 horsepower engines. Uh, neither of those two projects that we funded was ever able to get a working locomotive out of the factory. But you will see that yellow tender, which is one of the two we bought, you will be seeing that here coming up. So keep that uh, image in mind. Uh, again, what we're looking at here is uh, uh, you know, interoperability between the railroads. And, and what has happened uh, late last year, the Association of American Railroads formed a technical advisory group which consists of railroad uh, engineering type people. And uh, we are in the process of uh, meeting, and our goal is to come up with performance standards for LNG tenders, which will meet various criteria, including uh, being cooperative and working with the regulators to make sure that the technology, if it's going to be adopted, can be adopted. And I mentioned that tender. Well, one of those two yellow tenders that you saw is this tender here. It's painted in Canadian National colors now. And of course, Canadian National is your rail, it's your hometown railroad here in Champaign. Uh, it's the only railroad, I, well, you've got uh, Norfolk Southern operating through here as well. But the big facility uh, over here on the, uh, on the west side is uh, Canadian National, their north-south mainline. And uh, Union Pacific, uh, we, we leased one of our two tenders to Canadian National. And uh, Canadian National equipped two older 3,000 horsepower locomotives. And they have this consist running between Edmonton and Fort McMurray in Alberta. And I've been up there twice looking at it. Uh, on the bottom left, you can see a cryogenic uh, semi-trailer in the process. So uh, they were refilling, uh, they were putting about 4,000 gallons of LNG into that tender car. And um, so essentially, Canadian National has, uh, in this case, they have uh, restarted in effect, the technology test that the Burlington Northern uh, had stopped working with in 1995. It's the same technology, low pressure, and then there are various other programs looking at high pressure uh, gas injection as well. And, and a key thing to look at here, this bottom right photograph, I hope you can see all these connections. Instead of simply having the, the couplers, between, the coupler between the car and the locomotive, a coupler and a coupler, uh, and the air brake hole is you also have a glycol supply and a glycol return. You have a gas hose providing methane from the tender to the locomotive. So the, the issue of coming up with tenders and dual fuel locomotives, you can see is very complex because you have all these specialized connections between the tender and the locomotive to actually pass methane gas from the tender to the locomotive. So more development work. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about uh, battery storage. This is not new technology. A man named Leo Daft 
built a locomotive in 1883. He ran it on a short railroad uh, in near Syracuse, New York. It was called the Ampere. It was a two-axle locomotive. It ran on what was called a third rail, which was a power rail between the two running rails. So it was like if you've ever had a Lionel train uh, uh, with the old uh, three rail technology, the power came off the third rail in the middle and went through the motor and uh, was returned to the two outer or running rails. Two years later in 1885, he actually put lead acid batteries on it and he created the first battery powered locomotive. That was in 1885. There have been a number of other battery locomotive ventures out there. Uh, there were two battery locomotives on the North Shore Line, which was a, an interurban line between Chicago and Milwaukee. My mother's father had a farm which shared a fence line with that railroad. And the railroad was abandoned in 1963. Uh, those two locomotives operated from 1927 to 1963, and they were used to switch industries which were off the main line and which did not have an overhead trolley wire. So it was a battery locomotive, it recharged off the trolley wire. And Union Pacific, we ourselves uh, at one time had a total of 21 of what are called the Green Goat locomotive, a, a, 25, a locomotive with 25 tons of lead acid batteries and a small diesel generator set to recharge the batteries. We still have seven operating. There are issues with battery technology, uh, safety issues with batteries. And uh, I mean, when you look at advanced batteries, lithium ion, I think you all know there, there are some issues with lithium ion. Uh, one of the aircraft manufacturers is going through uh, a learning curve right now with lithium ion batteries. The Green Goat locomotive that we have used lead acid, which is not the most energy or the most storage efficient battery technology, but it was affordable. Uh, we simply could not afford at this point in time or even five years ago to have a battery locomotive with lithium ion batteries. You simply couldn't afford it. Uh, capacity, discharge cycle, cycles, life cycle, overall life of the batteries. And again, affordability versus capability. Uh, this is battery power is great, especially for things like regenerate the idea of regenerative braking. Dynamic braking is where the motors become generators to retard or slow down the train. And currently, dynamic braking energy is dissipated to the air through resistor grids. The concept of regenerative braking with a diesel locomotive would be to take that regenerative, that dynamic braking energy, and pump it into batteries and then reuse it for traction. But you have to keep in mind, every time you go from one energy state to another, when you go from uh, kinetic energy to electrical energy, and take the electrical energy and put it into batteries, and then subsequently take it out of the batteries, put it back into the motors. Every time you go from one energy form to another, there are efficiency losses. There are some doubts about the economics of battery regeneration, a regenerative power on a battery locomotive, uh, because of what you, the amount of power that you ultimately get out at the end of the food chain, so to speak. And just some photos here. You can see Mr. Daff's locomotive when it was originally built in 1883, and then again in 1885 he removed the contactor for the center rail and put batteries. Uh, there's a photo of a General Electric battery switcher at Schenectady, New York, 1922. Uh, here's the one of the locomotives on the North Shore Line. Uh, I found out that uh, the Chicago and Northwestern actually had a battery, a battery locomotive operating at Proviso Yard in 1928. And uh, I, I actually found a report on the locomotive. They used it on the hump instead of an 060 steam locomotive. And they would typically work for four to six hours. And then they would have to take the locomotive off the hump and take it back to the roundhouse to recharge the batteries. Capacity was an issue. And uh, then we, again, we have the Green Goat locomotive with 25 tons of lead acid batteries. But you can only use about 14, 15% of the available charge to avoid deep cycling and destroying the batteries. Flywheels, um, in effect, a mechanical battery. Uh, the idea here again would be to capture and reuse dynamic braking energy. Uh, you take the energy and spin up the flywheel to store the energy and you take the energy out by drawing, making the flywheel run a generator to take the energy out. Uh, the Union Pacific actually had a program in the 1990s. We were looking at flywheel technology uh, on a flywheel booster type unit. We call it a slug, no engine, to uh, ex do exactly that, capture dynamic braking energy. 
And uh, again, we're talking about technology and economics. Uh, these flywheels are high-speed rotors. They have to be in containment bodies. They operate in a vacuum uh, to minimize spin down due to aerodynamic drag and uh, cost. And the ultimate race in this area of technology in the railroad world, I think, will be between batteries and flywheels. But when that race will play out, I can't say. Uh, electrification. Electric, electrification is where you use uh, over, typically overhead wire to provide electricity to an electric locomotive, which does not have a diesel engine on it. So your power comes from the overhead wire. Typically, uh, mainline railroad electrifications are either 15, 25, or 50,000 volt AC. Uh, you have centralized emissions because your, your energy is created at central power plants, so your emissions are centralized as opposed to locomotives with self-propulsion which are mobile emitters of emissions. And so you have possible trade-offs here in terms of uh, power plants, depending on where the power is coming from. Is the power coming from a hydro plant, a nuclear plant, uh, a thermal plant? Is it coming from renewables with battery, et cetera? The, the emissions trade-off uh, in this area is not clear. It depends on the source of the electricity. Is electric propulsion more efficient than diesel electric? I say uncertain. The evidence that I've seen so far, a number of studies done around the world, is that when you factor in all of the various losses, remember, electric power generation is about 35% efficient. So when you factor in a fraction of a percent losses in high voltage transmission lines, switchgears, and so on, and get it to the overhead wire where the locomotive pantograph can draw those amps down to the locomotive, you're down again to about 33% efficiency at the rail which is where the diesel electric locomotives are. So people have claimed that an electric railroad is more energy efficient than a diesel electric railroad. That is not necessarily so. Uh, the greatest hurdles are, there are three of them. Infrastructure, you have to have the overhead structure, the wires, catenary, and so on. CapEx, which is an abbreviation for capital expenditures. It's a major investment, particularly if you're talking long distances and power. And by power, I mean the interface where the power comes from, which would be the power grid. Uh, again, massive investment, construction of the overhead. The construction would be phased. It's very uh, uh, construction intensive to put in overhead wire. And again, the last item is adequacy of the power and uh, the grid's ability to support the load. And you also have, if you don't do an entire system, if you have a fragmented system of some electric operation and the rest diesel electric, or worst case, electric, diesel electric, and electric at yet the other end, you end up potentially with what are called power change points, where you take the electric locomotive off, put on a diesel electric, run to the other end, take the diesel electric off, and put on electric. Now you're introducing more delays to the movement of the trains. Again, just a photo of what overhead wires look like. This is a switching locomotive in Switzerland. And you can see the pantograph, the catenary wire, there's a messenger wire above that, vertical hangers. You have poles. The catenary wire typically has to be tensioned with counterweights and pulleys to keep constant tension so you don't get sagging and so on. Uh, it, is, it is not a simple uh, installation. <clears throat> Electrification of railroads in Europe is the frequent baseline that has been mentioned by many people in discussions about electrifying freight railroads in the United States. More than 50% of train operations in Europe are electrically powered. Most of the rail systems in the European Union uh, were, and many still are, government built and government funded. One thing that the European railroads do exceptionally well, and I underscore the word exceptionally, is move people. Most of the railroads in Europe were built and are operated for the, the express purpose of moving passengers, and freight is a secondary consideration and need. Uh, an example of this is uh, at a heavy haul conference a number of years ago, a gentleman from Germany was talking about scheduling algorithms for trains in northern Germany, and he mentioned how they were operating iron ore trains at 60 miles an hour to barely stay out of the way of passenger trains. You have to keep in mind, probably 
80% of the trains in Europe are passenger trains, the minority are freight. So there's a real conflict between freight and passenger in Europe. The average freight train in the European Union has about 6,000 horsepower in locomotive and about 1,000 tons, and again, it's limited by the couplers. The average freight train on our railroad is about 9,000 horsepower and 8,000 tons, and we have trains that go all the way up to 21,000 tons. So there's a real difference between North American and European railroads, and, and it's not a fair comparison. A two-track mainline in Germany can see 200 to 300 passenger trains per day, most of that passenger. On our three-track, triple-track mainline between North Platte and Gibbon Junction, about 100 miles in eastern Nebraska, that is the heaviest density freight mainline in the world. We operate 120 to 150 freight trains per day, and they're all in this 8,000 or more ton range. So you can see there's a real difference, again, between Europe and North America. A uh, chart I'm not going to go in detail, but this is from a... Uh, a report of uh, the, the European equivalent of the AAR. And you can see Germany, for example, has the greatest mileage, and they are 56% uh, electrified. And uh, so this chart is in the presentation. You can see what the split is on diesel versus electric in Europe. Uh, a, a simple chart here, bottom, let's just focus on the chart at the bottom. This is rail share of total ground transportation. You can see since 1980, when the freight rail, the US railroads were deregulated, we have gone from 30% market share up to 40%. In Europe, the railroads are still losing freight share to trucks. And it has to do with interoperability or the lack thereof. Um, I'm sure everybody knows Agatha Christie and uh, her, th her famous work, uh, Murder on the Orient Express. David Suchet is the actor who played uh, Inspector Perot on the TV series. And uh, two years ago, he did a special, he hosted a special where he rode the current version of the Orient Express from Calais on the English Channel, 2,000 miles to Prague in the Czech Republic. The train traveled across, across six countries, and at each of the five border crossings, the locomotive had to be changed because the French locomotive was not compatible with Switzerland or Germany or Italy, Austria. Or, or the Czech Republic, and and I love. I actually found uh, one of the uh, one of the videos on on YouTube, and I made these screenshots. And here he's he's saying bye bye, and he's waving. This is at Brenner, Austria, at the top of Brenner Pass. He's waving goodbye to the Austrian locomotive. And by the way, hot death. This is uh, the the PBS video on YouTube with. Norwegian subtitles. So this is your language lesson. Hadet is goodbye in, in Norwegian. But he's saying goodbye as the Austrian locomotive goes away, and then he says, that's gone, and an Italian locomotive will come all the way, and I love this next scene, he goes, and join that, because that is the Orient Express without a locomotive. And he made comment of the fact that in his trip, which took, I think it was two, two and a half days, they were delayed at five borders to change the locomotives because they weren't interoperable. And again, this is just a, a graphic example of the impact of not having interoperability. Uh, and I would point out, that's got to be about the easiest train to change locomotives. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not like a freight train where we have locomotives in the front and distributed power remotely controlled in the middle and at the back of the train where you would have to change out not only the head end but the middle and the rear of the train as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a comparison between U.S. and, and, and Europe, Th this chart, I think, in the middle here is the key. This is the electrification voltages, and you can see there's four different colors. There is 750 volt DC, which is third rail in England, and on the mainland, you have 1500 volt DC, uh, you have 3000 volt DC, and you have 15,000 volt, 16 and two thirds uh, hertz AC power. And, and you can see uh, there, there are some locomotives, some electric locomotives that have been delivered in the past couple of years, which can actually operate under three voltages. But they have to have three different sets of electrical gear on board the locomotive and three different pantographs because, and I didn't put the fourth one here, there's even countries have different widths of their pantograph, the, the, the current collection device on top of the locomotive. Europe has no interoperability between locomotives. And let's complicate it with gauge. Uh, 
the, the, the gauge for most of the continent is standard gauge, same as in North America, which is four foot eight and a half inches or 1,435 millimeters. In, in, the, in Russia and the former Soviet states like Estonia, it's the Soviet gauge, which is four foot 11 and five sixth inch, which is 1,520 millimeters. And in the Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain and Portugal, it is five foot five and two thirds inches, which is uh, 1,665 millimeters between the rails. And now there is a high speed line in Spain, and, uh, or I think Portugal may have been converted. No, that's Volta Chair. Uh, there is, I think, a, a high speed line in Spain, which is standard gauge. But again, you know, to, to, to move freight between Spain and France, it's difficult because the, the wheel gauges are different. So this, this issue of interoperability is very, very significant. Uh, there are some electrified operations that, uh, that approach United States or North American standards. This is the ore company LKAB in Sweden. They run between the iron ore mine at Karuna and Dr. Barkin, you visited that underground mine. And they go to a uh, year round uh, Arctic cold water port uh, in Norway and another port in Sweden. And they use these uh, 7,200 horsepower electric locomotives. Their standard train is 68 cars long. And again, we have bulk or heavy haul trains that are up to 140 cars long. So even there, there's still a difference. Dual mode locomotives have been mentioned. This is an electro, uh, what I call an electro diesel. You have a diesel electric locomotive, and you also have all the equipment for an electric locomotive on board, transformer, switch gear, etc. cetera. Uh, it, it's simply, bottom line, not feasible to take a contemporary US freight locomotive. Uh, some of these dual mode locomotives have been built for New Jersey Transit and the Commuter Authority of Montreal. They use two smaller high-speed diesel engines to reduce the size of the equipment in the car body and the weight. Uh, they have a uh, water-cooled transformer down here uh, above a half-capacity half 2,400-gallon fuel tank. These drawings are to scale. This is a contemporary U.S. locomotive, U.S.-Canadian-Mexican locomotive. Uh, you can see basically this cabinet is filled with power electronics, uh, alternator, diesel engine, cooling system, there is virtually no room on a contemporary diesel electric North American freight locomotive to put all of this electric equipment. There's simply no room in the inn. There are some unconventional alternatives that have been uh, proposed. I'm uh, just going to touch on them. One is magnetic levitation, which is actually uh, levitated, or you'd, you'd have to have floating. In effect, you float on a magnetic field. And another is the use of linear induction motors. And what's been proposed is to put uh, linear motor coils bolted to the cross ties between the rails and then you have aluminum reaction plates on the bottom side of your cars and locomotives and the magnetic field produced by the induction motor on the track actually drags the reaction plate uh, along with the magnetic field as it moves down the length of the motors and uh, the problem here is clearances underneath the rolling stock and again how do, how do you maintain, how do you have 1.4 million freight cars on the continent that are interoperable between mostly, for the most part, between US, Canada, and Mexico? How do you equip them with these reaction plates on the bottom and still maintain an interoperable network? The cheapest energy, in my opinion, is efficiency. Uh, and, and go back again to that Lawrence Livermore chart. Uh, there's always room for improvement. Are we ever going to get to 100% efficiency? No. It's an admirable goal, but the, the, the laws of this universe, particularly in thermodynamics, say we will never get there. It's a train that will never arrive in the station. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's an admirable goal, but you'll never get there. Uh, but again, uh, finding efficiency improvements can, in some cases, be the best way to, in effect, either gain lower cost energy or reduce your amount of energy usage. And, um, you know, there are control systems. Uh, what about rolling stock designs? Can we change the weight or the design to make the car carry more, the freight car, can it carry more? One of the constraints we have in this industry is because we're dealing with capital machinery, freight cars, for example, are typically built for, they're designed for a 30 to 40 year life because they're, they're relatively expensive and they're designed to serve decades of, of use. So. It's difficult to, uh, to make changes, especially when you're going to have machines that are going to be operating for decades. So 
How, how do you phase in? Do you start modifying cars? Well, the issue with modifying freight cars is, again, 1.4 million freight cars on the continent, 66% of the freight cars are not owned by the railroads. They're owned by shippers, by car leasers, by private car owners. We as a railroad cannot go in and modify a non-railroad car without permission from the car owner. Uh, it, it's, it's like, you, you know, I've got a rental car out here and I go and put nitrous oxide on it and then hand it back to, you know, take it back to the airport in Bloomington and say, well, yeah, I put nitrous oxide on it. Well, uh, they wouldn't be too happy. Uh, but you must start somewhere. And again, going back to Mr. Steele and his technological misconceptions and his realities, simplest improvements can often be the best oftentimes the quickest, and oftentimes carry the lowest risk. And that brings us to what we call the arrow wedge. And uh, what we've been doing for several years is looking at aerodynamic drag on several aspects of aerodynamic drag on double stack trains. And the first area that we've actually got, uh, we're in the process of bringing this out. The devices are being built right now. We are focusing on the pressure drag of the block body, the top, first container behind the locomotives. You can see that sticks up about five feet above the roof line of the locomotives. And 98, 99% of our double stack trains are not filled with two containers in every well. So there's always open spaces and we're really not losing revenue. But what we've got, uh, we built a prototype two and a half years ago. We actually tested it at Pueblo on the uh, seven mile high speed test track. Um, and then we, we embarked on building 12 pre-production units, and we've got these being built right now in Omaha at a, at a fabricator. And uh, the, the purpose is to, in effect, uh, reduce the pressure drag on that first container behind the locomotive. Uh, we have a U.S. patent granted. We have uh, several Canadian additional U.S. and Canadian patents granted. And we're going to be operating this between our uh, intermodal uh, facility in Joliet, Illinois, and uh, Long Beach, California in round trip service. And uh, we feel that the, uh, the fuel saving will more than pay for this device very, very quickly. Uh, and again, uh, we've got several other aspects of, of stack train uh, aerodynamics uh, which are under investigation. And that brings me to the, the closing slide here. And, and I, I always, when I talk about technology, I always go back and think about this quote. I found this in an SAE paper. It was a gentleman named Lyle Small. He was the executive engineer at the Lima Hamilton Company, which back in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s was actually the Lima Locomotive Company in Lima, Ohio. And it merged with the Hamilton Engine Company, and they, 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 one, one day they essentially stopped building steam locomotives and went into the field of building diesel-electric locomotives. And Mr. Small was talking to the Society of Automotive Engineers in June of 1949 about advanced engine technology. He was even talking about gas turbines and free piston gasifiers. And he presented that paper on June 5th, 1949. Fifteen months later, his company closed the doors. They went out of business because of market conditions and various other factors. But his comment here about the bleached bones, every industry, every technological field has those who make it to the finish line and those who don't. And it's a tough road. And uh, I, I hope it's been helpful to you, especially, again, going back to the comments about technological realities. Uh, in, in my experience as an engineer and a manager, more as a manager of technology than as an engineer creating technology and forming it, there is more to managing technology than coming up with an equation or an invention or finding a way to apply something. There are all of these other factors which are out there waiting to trip you up. And you need to be aware of them and you need to move on because your goal, like my goal, all of us have a goal of getting to the finish line with our projects and, and in our fields. And I wish you the best and I hope this was uh, helpful and meaningful to you. So. At that, we'll, uh, we'll say uh, hadet, as they say in uh, Norway, hadet. Goodbye.
No question. Great. Yes, sir. Just a comment. Your your comparison of the European rail in the 90s, there was a representative from Europe rail spent a couple of days here and got to know him pretty well. We had a lot of good conversations. And the question was posed because everybody thought European rail was so superior to the U.S. rail. And the question was posed why he was looking. He said, for one simple reason, your railroads make a profit. That's, that's true. Uh, railroads, railroads on North America are, with the exception of the commuter operations, uh, investor-owned. And of course, we know Amtrak and, and Via Rail Canada
SVB Infra, which owns the track, the signals, the stations, and they also own hydro dams and they're a part owner in one nuclear power plant. So, I mean, you can see Switzerland is 100% electrified river. It's also what I call a nation state. It's, it's like a, you know, a small U.S. state. It is not a large political body, but they are 100% electrified. In fact, they even electrify all of their rail yards. They do have some diesel locomotives, but not many. But again, it depends on what's the origin of the electricity. Is it coming from a hydro plant, a nuclear, thermal plant, et cetera? I was going to point out, Riley, another issue with electricity, the power plant area of electricity is obviously the variation of cost of that day. And it's a case where efficiency doesn't necessarily translate to cost. If you can only tra charge your batteries or run your trains in the middle of the night, the generator will pretty much give you the power. So it's still maybe only 30% efficient, but it's also almost free. But you also, one thing we really do Right, but, but, but again, you know, we have to balance that ability to operate 24 hours a day. You have to balance that against what, what I feel is a relatively big unknown, and that's the ability of the grid in general to supply the power when it's needed. But, and you have to keep in mind, a 4, 000, one 4,400 horsepower locomotive, uh, quick calculation from the engineers, what's that, about 3,600 kilowatts? We have trains that have six, seven of those locomotives. I mean, you're talking 22,000, 22 megawatts on one freight train, okay? Uh, when the engineer, when he or she opens the throttle and works it out in a matter of minutes to notch eight, you are, you are demanding 22 megawatts of power. And the problem comes in, it as frequently happens, we have multiple trains on multiple tracks in the same area passing each other, going in opposite directions, and what if they're all drawing power at the very same time? Freight railroad electrification can be a very significant draw on the power supply. And, and we're not, I'm not anti-electrification of rail for the sake of being anti-electrification. I am simply saying there are many factors that have not yet been fully vetted for the North American application. Chris, was there more over here? No. Okay. Well, the, the, me, the, the meteor was supposed to pass two minutes ago, so <laughs> missed. New York time, 1.30 uh, Chicago time, so we're all here. All right, well, if there are any more questions, then thank you again for the Thank you. Somebody called me for a broken wooden shop. The real world. <laughs> oh, okay. Give a call back. Yes, sir. I was just wondering. You, know, uh, you, you talk a lot about this. A lot of opportunities on the main line. Mm -hmm. From your opinion, what's the loading improve for the yards, though? Well, in, in the yard, I mean, that, that was the, the whole area of the Green Goat locomotive using batteries. Uh, and and, and, and I, I didn't talk about it here. I know one of the other yards has what they call a plug in battery locomotive. It was a months ago. The idea is you could plug it into the grid instead of having an internal combustion engine to charge the batteries. But you still, it comes down to you still have to put energy into the batteries to get the batteries to provide more. What about the uh, gas? Yes, Tom. No, no, no problem. I'm sorry, I missed. I was finishing up. Here. Go ahead. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Call Bill Smells to get two nine four Tell him to get on the phone with Dave Malay. Tell him to get on the phone with Dave Malay. We need a big break. Trust. The one that Kelsey always thinks is broken because she never turns it on.